In the opening scene, a flight from Berlin is about to land at JFK Airport, New York. Inside, a nervous flight attendant calls his colleague and asks her to come to the cargo hold area immediately. On her way, she asks a little French girl, Emma, to turn off the music. She then proceeds to another passenger, Joan Luss, and tells her to sit back in an upright position as the plane is landing shortly. In the back, her terrified fellow attendant informs her that there is something alive in the cargo hold, even though there are no animals listed on the manifest. Confused, the female flight attendant opens the hold door, but sees nothing, when suddenly, a shrouded creature breaks through the door and attacks them. In the following scene, the plane has landed on the runway, but the airport officials don't find any signs of life on it. The 210 people on board have gone completely silent, and the plane has switched off all electronic signals. Seeing this, the airport in charge, Bishop, immediately calls several government agencies for reinforcement, mentioning that the situation is really bad. Elsewhere, we see an epidemiologist and the head of the Center for Disease Control, named Ephraim, attending court-mandated custody counseling. Ephraim and his wife Kelly are separated because he prioritizes his work before family. They share custody of their son, Zach. Now, sitting in front of a total stranger, Kelly chooses to announce that her boyfriend, Matt, is soon going going to move in with her and Zach, which Ephraim is not pleased about. During the custody session, Ephraim's emergency-only cell phone rings repeatedly, and as a result, he is forced to interrupt the counseling session. As he receives the call, he finds out about the plane. He then calls his junior, Nora, and tells her that he wants full control over the investigation. Soon, Ephraim arrives at JFK Airport and greets his colleagues, Nora and Jim. Homeland Security wants to treat the incident as a terrorist attack, but Ephraim explains to them the possibility of a virus and how contagion works. Eventually, because of his speech and his intimidating carton of milk, Homeland Security backs down and CDC takes charge. Elsewhere, in a pawn shop, two thugs try to sell a watch to the owner, Satrakian, an old man in his 90s. While Satrakian leans over to inspect the watch, the thief tries to steal some money through the plexiglass. However, Satrakian grabs his wrist and threatens to cut his vein with a knife that he has handy. The second thug has a gun, but Satrakian forces him to surrender. Scared of the old man, the thugs run away. Later, when Satrakian sees the news about the flight, he goes into his basement and brings out a cane that doubles as a sword. He then brings out a deformed heart, stored in a jar, and starts talking to it. Satrakian claims that the enemy has returned, and he is even more dangerous than the last time. Following this, he makes a small cut on his finger and drops his blood into the jar. Surprisingly, little worm-like tentacles come out of the heart and start feeding on the blood. Back at the airport, while Ephraim and Nora suit up for Biohazard and board the plane, he tells her about his court-ordered custody session. Nora references her relationship with Ephraim during the year that he and Kelly separated. Apparently, they had an affair, and Ephraim never told Kelly because she filed for divorce before he had a chance. Afterward, they board the plane and find everyone dead in their seats, without any signs of struggle or marking. At first sight, it seems as if the deaths were painless. On further investigation, they also find evidence of abundant ammonia, but it's not toxic enough to kill anyone. Meanwhile, Ephraim kneels down next to the French girl, Emma, who seems to have frozen dead in her seat. He reports that her tongue is pale and there's no frothing or blood. Just then, Nora turns on the UV lights, and with this, they see strange patches all over the plane. Looks like there was a party in here. As they move towards the back of the plane, we see one of the dead passengers' hands twitch. In the next scene, the duo reaches the back and notices the open door to the cargo hold, where the ammonia patches are everywhere. While Ephraim observes it, Nora moves to the cockpit and discovers that even the pilots are dead. As she observes one of the pilots, he suddenly wakes up, startling the life out of her. A few moments later, three passengers, a metal star, Bolivar, Joan, and a guy named Ansel also reanimate. Seeing them, Ephraim immediately radios for help, mentioning that there are survivors. Elsewhere, at the Stoneheart Investment Company, Thomas Eichhorst, a German man with strange eyes, visits Palmer, the chairman of Stoneheart Group, and also one of the world's richest men. While Palmer is having dialysis administered by his head of security, Eichhorst delivers a message that the cargo has arrived safely, and all four survivors have been found. Here, we get to know that Palmer and Eichhorst know something about the mysterious deaths of the passengers. Back at JFK Airport, the director of the CDC, Everett Barnes, 
shows up and supports Ephraim's decision to quarantine the four survivors. Later, in the Q-Zone, Nora tries to talk to one of the survivors, Joan. She is a high-powered attorney and isn't cooperative at all. Following this, Ephraim and Nora talk to the pilot, Redfern, who doesn't remember anything after landing. While another survivor, Ansel, complains about hearing some weird noises, the rock star Bolivar is concerned about scoring drugs. Meanwhile, Jim calls Ephraim after he finds a giant, nine-foot-tall, coffin-like box that is not listed on the manifest. They lower it to the ground and open it and find it full of soil. Confused by the structure, Ephraim immediately asks the officials to take samples of the soil for testing. In the following scene, the airport in charge, Bishop, is on the phone, yelling at someone in Berlin about the coffin-like box. Suddenly, he hears a strange noise and begins following it around the cargo storage area. There, he finds blood spilled on the floor and something pulsing under a cloak. As he goes near it, a giant creature rises and extends a tentacle from its mouth into Bishop's neck, sucking all of his blood and draining him out. Then, it throws him to the ground and smashes his head before fleeing. That felt a little extra. Elsewhere, the German Eichhorst visits a Latino gangster, Gus, and assigns him to pick up a van with a box from the airport and deliver it to Stoneheart. At first, Gus refuses, claiming that it is a very dangerous mission. However, when Eichhorst promises to fix his mother's immigration status and clear his brother's criminal records, he agrees. After this, Eichhorst gives him three rules. Don't examine the cargo, don't make any stops, and make it back to the rendezvous point by daybreak. Additionally, Eichhorst gives Gus a black business card that will grant him access to the airport amid strict security. Meanwhile, the old man, Satrakian, arrives at the airport where all the victims' families are gathered to protest. Although he is stopped by the security, he fakes a heart attack and gets close enough to talk to him about the plane. Later, Ephraim faces the victims' families on the media, briefing that there are only four survivors among the 210 passengers and that they have no explanation for it yet. He also mentions that the dead bodies can't be handed over to the families due to the risk of the unknown virus. Hearing this, the crowd begins to protest, and this one guy even scores a critical hit, slapping his face. But Ephraim assures them that he will provide answers within 48 hours. In the next scene, a medical examiner video calls Ephraim and Nora, showing that the bodies have non-traumatic incisions on their necks. In addition, their body chemistry has been altered, preventing them from decomposing normally. The bodies are also filled with a white ooze instead of blood. After a while, as Ephraim and Nora are heading to examine the aircraft, Satrakian, who is also present there, suddenly mentions that the corpses must be beheaded and burnt, along with the giant coffin. However, Jim and Ephraim think that he is crazy. They also notice a sword in the old man's cane, and they have him arrested. Later that night, the medical guy examines a body under UV light and discovers strange worm-like patterns under the skin. Elsewhere, Ephraim and Nora examine the plane's cargo hold, where they find a tiny worm, writhing around and trying to make contact with their skin. They consider it to be a parasite looking for a host and put it inside a bottle. Just then, Nora finds a bunch of other worms in a clump of soil nearby. Immediately, they go to search for the coffin, but find it missing. They then head to the security room, but the CCTV cameras show that the coffin disappeared into thin air. When Ephraim asks to pause the footage, he notices a strange entity lifting the coffin and disappearing off the top of the frame. Since the footage is only seven minutes old, Ephraim orders Jim to seal off the airport and stop to check all the vehicles that are likely to carry the coffin, because if something straight up flew away with it, it must be in a car. Later, Gus puts on his fake ID and gets in the van with the coffin and drives off. However, after only a short while, he is stopped by the police who ask him to pull over. Just as he is about to get exposed, Jim arrives. He then shows Jim the business card that Eichhorst gave him, and surprisingly, Jim lets him go. Here, we get to know that Jim is also working for Eichhorst and Palmer. Damn, imagine he did Frodo dirty like that though. Afterward, the medical examiner removes a deformed heart from a corpse. To his surprise, the heart starts to beat, shedding worms. One of them gets into the examiner's hand and he frantically manages to remove it with a tweezer. Just then, all the corpses, even the dissected ones, rise from their beds and attack him. Elsewhere, Satrakian has been held captive in jail over the weekend because charges have been pressed and there's no judge to hear the case. Meanwhile, another inmate notices that Satrakian has a Holocaust tattoo with the number A230385. Back at Stoneheart, Eichhorst reports to the billionaire Palmer
bummer that everything went well. However, he mentions that the Jew, aka Satrakian, is still after something. It appears as if the three have a history, which dates back decades. Before leaving, he assures Palmer that he will take care of everything. The next morning, before dawn, Gus crosses the bridge in the van, carrying the coffin. In the following scene, Emma's father returns home heartbroken and is in shock to see Emma at the door. She looks green and infected, saying that she's cold. The father hugs her tight and is relieved that she is home, even in the condition that she is in. Later, Gus arrives at an underground parking garage. When he doesn't see Eichhorst around, he gets curious and tries to inspect the coffin inside the van. As he goes near the coffin, it starts growling and thumping, prompting Gus to run away from there as fast as he can. Back at JFK Airport, Ephraim, Nora, and Jim find Bishop's body with a smashed head. They also discover the same white discharge and ammonia. Meanwhile, at the quarantine zone, the four survivors decide to leave the place and go back to their families. Although Ephraim mentions that they are still in danger, the quartet doesn't comply. With no options left, Ephraim calls the police, who take charge. Seeing this, Joan gets mad and calls the Secretary of Health and Human Services. In no time, the Secretary calls Ephraim and declares the quarantine invalid valid due to lack of evidence. To add to his problems, Ephraim is even suspended by his boss. At the Stoneheart Group, Palmer and Eichhorst talk about how the CDC is hindering their plans. It is revealed that Palmer was the one who got the survivors out, using his influence. Elsewhere, in jail, Eichhorst meets Cetrakian and tells him that the Master is watching Cetrakian through him. Here, we get to know that Eichhorst was one of the Nazi generals at the concentration camp where Cetrakian, a Jew, was held. Before leaving, Leaving, Eichhorst taunts him, reminding him of his wife's death. In the next scene, Nora and Ephraim meet the pilot, Redfern, in a bar and begin to interrogate him. Redfern explains that the box was loaded onto the plane by government officials. Hearing this, Ephraim is taken aback and he convinces the pilot to be admitted to the hospital for an in-depth examination. Next, we see survivors Joan and Bolivar at dinner when they start hearing strange noises in their heads. Joan's lips start to bleed into her wine, making her her rush outside. At Stoneheart, Palmer's assistant informs him that he has located a suitable donor liver. Palmer thinks he might not need it anymore, but agrees to the plan as a backup. Later that day, Ephraim goes to his wife, Kelly's house, where she tells him that she's glad he's on the case. Ephraim finds his son in the back with Matt, converting his old office into a game room. Surprisingly, instead of being angry, he extends a friendly hand to Matt and asks him to keep his family safe. He also encourages Zach to be honest at the custody hearing so that he can get joint custody. Custody. In the following scene, Bolivar is in bed with three women when one of the girls runs her hand through his hair. It starts to fall out. Soon, he fixes on one of the girl's necks and bites her, drawing blood. When the woman panics, he kicks everyone out, but he soon starts licking her trail of blood off the floor. At the hospital, Ephraim and Nora look at the pilot under UV light and find the same incision on his neck, along with the worms crawling under his skin. At the same time, Emma's father calls Ephraim to thank him for sending Emma home and then hangs up. This stuns the duo and they wonder how a dead person is alive. Hence, they immediately head to the morgue to find the truth. Elsewhere, Palmer's assistant drives him to the parking garage, where Gus had delivered the coffin. Soon, Eichhorst also joins Palmer, just as he is about to open the coffin. Suddenly, the master swoops in, revealing his face to Palmer, who looks terrified, but happy. Afterward, Ephraim and Nora arrive at the morgue and find the front desk chair knocked over and the phone off the hook. The morgue is ransacked and deserted. When the lights don't work, they look around with flashlights, finding all the body bags empty. Back at her house, Emma sits in a cold tub in the dark. Her dad notices her hair is falling out. When he leans in, a big tentacle suddenly sprouts out of Emma's mouth and latches onto his neck, killing him. <laughs> Teenagers, right? In the next scene, a horrible creature without a nose listens to opera and puts on a rubber nose and neck to cover his deformities, along with a wig, dentures, and a thick layer of makeup. Turns out that it is Eichhorst. Later, Ephraim's colleague Jim wonders to himself what he did by letting the van with the coffin through. Hence, he calls someone and argues. That afternoon, he goes to the Stoneheart group to meet Palmer, but Eichhorst meets him instead. Jim threatens to call the police because of the coffin and the chaos related 
to it. However, Eichhorst offers a limited drug trial for Jim's wife, Sylvia, who has a rare kind of cancer, and also gives him an envelope full of money. Because of the offers, Jim backs off. Meanwhile, another survivor from the plane, Ansel's condition, deteriorates as his eye becomes bloodshot, his teeth turn into fangs, and he hears a continuous high-pitched noise. When the feeling gets too overwhelming, he goes to the fridge and takes out a box of raw steak with blood. As he devours it with his new tentacle tongue, his wife catches him in the act and becomes terrified. In the next scene, Satrakian is finally released and he finds Nora waiting for him. He immediately tells her to find the corpses and burn them, but Nora hesitates. At the family court, Ephraim and Kelly attend a custody hearing for Zack. Upon being asked by the judge, Zack says his dad should see him one or two weekends a month because he has a very important job. As a result, Ephraim doesn't get joint custody. Later, Ephraim yells at Kelly for taking his son away from him. Then, we're introduced to a pest control specialist named Vasily. He goes to an apartment to get rid of rats and notices a swarm of them pouring out of the city's sewers into the river. At Satrakian's pawn shop, a hacker brings him a list of the plane's passengers. Beginning with the first passenger, Emma, Satrakian leaves on his mission to destroy all the corpses. Meanwhile, Bolivar is transitioning rapidly. As his hair falls out, his face turns gray and splotchy, and he loses his genitals. That's right, in this world, vampires' dicks fall off. At the hospital, Jim, Ephraim, and Nora get the word that the pilot has disappeared. Hence, they split up to search the hospital. Soon, Jim finds him in the basement, sucking bags of blood. When the pilot tries to attack him with his tentacle tongue, Nora appears, so he turns on her. As the pilot is about to attack, Ephraim arrives in the nick of time and smashes his head with a fire extinguisher. Although the pilot's head is smashed, tiny worms are oozing out from it. Nora remembers what's Trachean said about cutting off the head and burning the body. But first, Ephraim wants to examine it. Elsewhere, Ansel's wife, Anne-Marie, takes their kids to his sister's house and leaves him alone to rest at home with their dog. When she returns home, she finds her dog dead, with its throat and insides ripped out. Slowly, she goes to the outhouse, which smells disgusting. She finds Ansel hiding in the shadows, but he suddenly emerges and snarls at her. He's covered in blood and has chained himself by his neck so that he doesn't harm her. Since the voice in his head forces him to drink her blood, he growls at her to run. Somewhere else, Palmer and Eichhorst meet a hacker and ask her to crash the internet in exchange for a good amount of money. At the hospital, Nora and Ephraim examine the dead pilot, and Jim films them. As they cut him open, they find new body systems, along with a six-foot tentacle, which they pull out of the corpse. This is one of the craziest prosthetics I've ever seen. This show is amazing. His genitals are also missing, like Bolivar's, and they notice the smell of ammonia, just like on the plane. Jim feels guilty and confesses that he let the van with the coffin go out of the airport for the sake of his wife's treatment. In a fit of rage, Ephraim punches him in the face and leaves. Soon after, a disappointed Nora also leaves the place with the autopsy footage. In the following scene, Anne-Marie buries her dog and pushes her arrogant neighbor into the shed, feeding him to Ansel. Elsewhere, Gus and his friend Felix steal a Mercedes and go to Alonso, an illegal car dealer. Felix has heard that Alonso pays $1,000 for the cars, but they end up with only $800. At Stoneheart, Palmer passes out, and when he wakes up, the doctor tells him that they have a new liver for his transplants. Next, Nora and Ephraim go to Emma's house and find her in the basement. She immediately lashes her tentacle tongue at them to attack. As they try to get rid of Emma, Satrakian emerges from the shadows and beheads her with his silver sword. Badass. Filch may be a muggle, but he doesn't need a goddamn wand. Meanwhile, Emma's father arrives behind Ephraim and Nora, fully turned. Seeing this, Satrakian lops his head off too. He then warns Ephraim and Nora to stay away from the worms. Witnessing the carnage around them, Ephraim finally agrees with Satrakian decision to kill the infected. However, Nora is hesitant and leaves, saying there has to be another way. The following morning at Emma's house, Satrakian cooks scrambly eggs and reveals that someone named the Master is an ancient creature who feeds on the blood of his victims and turns them. The Master is a strigoi, a Romanian term for a vampire, and he is the one responsible for everything. He let four passengers live so the media would focus on them and not the dead, giving them time to go home and infect their families. 
In a flashback to Poland in 1944, Satrakian rides on a train with his grandmother and brother, being taken to a Nazi concentration camp. Before reaching the camp, Satrakian's grandmother reminds him of the evils she told stories about and thinks that they're going to meet one soon. Later, the train stops at a camp led by Eichhorst. Soon, Satrakian and his brother start to work as carpenters in the camp. In the present, Joan wakes up in her bed, very sick. When her kids bring her breakfast and hug her, she stares at her daughter's neck for a long time. The caretaker finds it weird and takes the kids away from her room. Meanwhile, Satrakian explains to Ephraim that he's going to take down every passenger from the plane, as all of them have turned. Next, they get to go to Ansel's house. Satrakian gives Ephraim a nail gun with silver nails, explaining that they will weaken the creature enough for him to get close and kill them. Furthermore, he discloses that people who have turned into vampires come back home for their loved ones and destroy them. In another flashback, the master swoops in at night in the bunkers of the concentration camp, feeding on the sleeping prisoners. When Satrakian witnesses this, he becomes terrified and tells his brother it's the same vampire from his grandmother's stories and he needs silver to kill it. His brother says, dude, we're dealing with Nazis here. Chill with that silver shit. In the present, Nora gets a call about her delusional mother, who wandered away from her nursing home, but they find her. The manager warns Nora that they will not keep her mother at the nursing home if she wanders off again. We're not doing our jobs, and that's your problem. Meanwhile, Ephraim and Satrakian reach Ansel's house and find that Anne-Marie has committed the unthinkable. Satrakian holds a silver mirror up to her, explaining that if she's infected, it will vibrate. Fortunately, it doesn't. Anne-Marie has left a note, saying where she has left the kids and that she can't face the world without Ansel. After this, the duo walks into the shed and Ephraim shoots Ansel with the nail gun before Satrakian beheads him. He also destroys the attacked neighbor who's about to turn inside the shed. The two then burn the shed and depart for their next mission. Meanwhile, Ephraim leaves Nora a message, saying that he wants to get a quarantine declared because of what he saw. At the Stoneheart group, Palmer wakes up after his liver transplant and feels energetic. However, the doctor warns him that he won't survive another major surgery, since he has been through many surgeries in the past. Back at Joan's house, the caretaker suggests that Joan see a doctor, but she refuses. When the caretaker notices Joan's growing eyelids, she packs her things and takes the kids to her home. Elsewhere, the pest control specialist, Vasily, is wondering the reason behind so many rats being led into the river. He opens underground access and goes into the tunnels. As he walks into the tunnel, he finds patches of ammonia everywhere, and hears something big swoop past him. Suddenly, a horde of vampires creeps out of the darkness and approaches him fast. Scared and unarmed, Vasily runs and escapes out of the tunnel, leaving its lid open. Surprisingly, the vampires are burnt by the sunlight. At the nursing home, Nora visits her mother. While walking her to her room, they hear people screaming. Suddenly, Nora sees a vampire attacking one of the residents and quickly hustles her mother the hell out of there. In the next scene, Ephraim shows the video of Ansel to Everett Barnes, asking to impose a quarantine on all the passengers and their families. However, Barnes refuses. Meanwhile, Jim realizes that the infection is spreading and warns Ephraim that Barnes has footage of Ephraim dragging the pilot's body. As Jim wants to correct his mistake, he helps Ephraim get out of the building. Soon after, Ephraim takes out his SIM card from the phone so that he can't be tracked. Before he escapes, he asks Jim to get the quarantine declared. The next day, we see Eichhorst in his vampire form, stepping into his white padded room with a man chained up. No word of a lie, this dude is a friend of mine in real life. He reels the chain and drags the man towards his feeding altar, lunging his tentacle to feed on him. <laughs> Poor Cody. Meanwhile, two FBI agents arrive at Kelly's house, looking for Ephraim, who sees the agents from across the street and stays hidden. Zach watches the news about his dad being wanted for questioning. Just then, Ephraim runs in through the back door and hugs his son. He tells Kelly that something awful is happening and asks her to leave the city with Zach immediately. However, his cuck Matt calls the FBI, who soon arrives and handcuffs Ephraim. Later, Kelly is mad at Matt and yells at him for interfering in her family matters. Elsewhere, Satrakian is on his mission to destroy the vampires. In one of the passengers' basements, he encounters several vampires who attack him. However, he manages to climb up the basement into the sunlight before they can grab him. Then, he burns the house and escapes. In the next scene, Nora gets a call from Jim, informing her about Ephraim's arrest. Just then, the FBI agents knock at her door. Realizing that she is in danger, Nora packs her bags and leaves through the back door. 
Elsewhere, Gus meets Eichhorst in the tunnel, where the latter assigns him to retrieve the remains of the pilot's body from the basement of the hospital and dispose of them. Gus refuses and strikes at Eichhorst, but he is easily overpowered and forcefully made to do as told. Later, Jim picks up Gus and his friend Felix and takes them to the hospital. Soon, they unload the body bag from the hospital and dump it in the river. Before dumping the body, Felix gets curious and unzips the bag to see the pilot's tentacle. Meanwhile, Vasily arrives at his work to find that his office is deserted and his colleagues have turned into vampires. He fights them by opening the shades and letting them burn in the sunlight. Back at the FBI headquarters, Ephraim tells his colleague about the contagious outbreak throughout New York City. As expected, the FBI agents don't believe him, so Ephraim volunteers to take them to the bodies and show them the proof. Elsewhere, at Kelly's house, she drinks with her close friend Diane and tells her about the fight with Matt after Ephraim's arrest. Diane encourages Kelly to leave the city if she wants. Today is the day of the solar eclipse, so people stroll along the streets, staring at the sun with special glasses on. The FBI agents with Ephraim are stuck in traffic. From the car, Ephraim notices that the medical examiner has turned into a vampire and is attacking people. Seeing this, both the agents are stunned and they immediately get out of the car to subdue the vampire. Sadly, they are completely useless and the vampire easily kills them. With this, Ephraim is left alone in the car, so he escapes. Elsewhere on the streets, Gus and Felix walk along the chaos, trying to save themselves from being attacked. Suddenly, a vampire appears and tries to attack Felix. Gus smashes the vampire's head and worms slither around, getting into Felix's hand. They struggle to get rid of the worm when the police suddenly arrive and arrest them for killing the vampire, who they think is a normal human. In the final scene, Ephraim goes to Satrakian's pawn store and says that he is ready to join him on his mission. Hearing this, Satrakian takes Ephraim downstairs to the basement room, where Ephraim is surprised to see Nora and her mother. The episode ends as the old man mentions that he has a new plan, since both Nora and Ephraim are now ready. To see what happens next, watch the second part in Series Recapped.